uh, our event today is a, a book event, uh, and the book is Edward Said, A Legacy of Emancipation and Representation, and we're really pleased to have with us uh, one of the co-editors of the book, Adil Iskandar, to talk about uh, the content of the book and do some reading as well uh, as answer uh, some questions that you may have uh, at the end of our event. Uh, I wanted to just point out that th there's, there's so much that can be said about Edward Said and his impact and uh, his, uh, his legacy, which is uh, what this book uh, discusses. But as uh, we watch the events that are unfolding about uh, new information coming out, about uh, private discussions through negotiations between the Israelis and Palestinians, uh, the developments uh, in, in Egypt today and so on. Uh, many uh, colleagues and friends had been passing around uh, an article uh, written in 1993 by Edward Said called The Morning After, referring uh, to the uh, Oslo Accords and the long-term impact of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, which, when viewed through uh, the events of today, uh, seem like sheer prophecy. So even uh, at this moment, this random moment of time, uh, when we come together to talk about uh, this book, uh, the work of, of Professor Edward Said is very much uh, relevant at, at this moment uh, and, and into the future as well. Uh, I hope you'll join me in welcoming our, our uh, speaker, uh, Adil Iskander, who is a lecturer at uh, the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University, and he's also uh, the author of Al Jazeera, the story of the network that is rattling governments and redefining modern journalism, perhaps more uh, this week than ever. Um, Adil, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, I want to first start off by thanking uh, everybody f uh, for being here. I know it's a, it's a difficult time to tear ourselves away from the computers. Uh, for, any, for all of us who are interested in the Middle East and how things are unfolding uh, right now, it's a, an absolutely compelling story. This is precisely what Edward Said had uh, both discussed, anticipated, and perhaps felt was a little bit uh, too late in coming. Um, I want to thank everybody here at the Palestine Center and Jerusalem Fun Fund for uh, agreeing to host uh, this event. Uh, uh, Mr. Yusuf Munayir, uh, the executive director of uh, the Palestine Center, was very gracious in uh, accepting uh, to host uh, this, uh, this book event. Um, admittedly, Edward Said uh, is probably one of the mo more eloquent and articulate uh, and active uh, spokespersons on behalf of, of the Palestinians, so uh, inadvertently he would be a friend of the Palestine Center. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is uh, sometimes incredibly easy to forget Edward Said's influence and, and impact as we proceed forward uh, through history. Nevertheless, we are reminded uh, gruesomely, uh, as we have in the past week or so, that uh, Edward Said's words are incredibly salient and poignant uh, to this day. Um, I'm not going to belabor you with uh, a discussion about Edward Said's impact. Most of us are familiar with who he was, and, uh, and so this isn't going to be a cursory discussion. But rather, uh, what I'd like to do is reflect a little bit about the book, the process that made it uh, what it is, why we uh, decided to forge forward and assemble uh, an, an edited volume about uh, Said. And then I'd like to share a few um, excerpts uh, from, from the volume. Uh, the book itself is very substantial in, and voluminous in size, uh, which explains why it took about seven years to compile. Um, the book has uh, somewhere in the range of 29 to 33 contributors, depending on whether you, you count the interviewers uh, and otherwise. Uh, the, it's divided into three major sections. Um, the first section is on uh, the colony and aesthetics, colony, post-colony, and the aesthetics, and uh, evokes uh, Edward Said's writings in uh, the early days, uh, pre-Oslo, but uh, focused on um, right, you know, his volumes such as Beginnings, uh, The World of Text and the Critic, um, uh, Culture and Imperialism, and also, the most, of course, the most seminal text of all, uh, and probably how Edward Said is most remembered, Orientalism. 
And then the second section focuses on uh, Edward Said's contributions and reflections and meditations and musings on uh, Palestine, Israel, and the post-colony. And the final section uh, basically discusses uh, the way forward, how intellectuals are to engage in the 21st century. How do, how do we understand the role of intellectualism uh, in our current day? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and read a segment here from the introduction about how uh, both myself and my co-editor, Hakim Rostom, who is a, a PhD candidate at London School of Economics in Anthropology, uh, came to um, engage with Edward Said. The paths to Edward Said's work are varied, whether it's via Cairo pub, anti-war activist circles on university campuses, or his numerous interviews now immortalized on Charlie, Charlie Rose's YouTube channel. We came across Said in the mid-1990s during our undergraduate studies at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. The frequently cited, sharply opinionated, and eloquent intellectual with a peculiarly hybrid name caught our attention and curiosity. As inquisitive undergraduates toiling our way through the liberal arts, we scoured the literature on the Middle East in an attempt to both overcome the emotional strain of our own migration and fulfill our desire for self-exploration. One book was impossible to miss on all Middle Eastern studies bookshelves, particularly because it stood in stark contrast to the Islamophobic literature that dominated the canon at the time. With Jean-Léon Jérôme's The Snake Charmer adorning the front of Edward Said's Orientalism, this striking cover invited further investigation, uh, unfortunately conveying both uh, curious familiarity as well as fetishized exoticism. This period happened to coincide with the deplorable 1997 attacks on tourists in Luxor, Egypt, a place that's in the news today. To, counter out, to counteract the, scene, the ceaseless denigration of the region and Islam in the Canadian press at the wake of the attacks, uh, we produced a 14-hour feature radio program entitled Through Arab Eyes on the local campus community radio station, then named CKDU-FM. The special broadcast sought to offer a corrective debate on the histories, politics, culture, and religions of the region. Sadly, uh, given our elementary understanding of the region, despite having come from, uh, from there, uh, we ended up offering something that remained somewhat monolithic, nevertheless. The intervention was an effort to overcome the deep void, invisibility, and perhaps violation caused by the incessant, alienating public discourse about the region and its peoples. Orientalism became an indispensable resource, a primer that helped us decipher and grapple with these issues, catalyzing our understanding of how and why negative discursive constructions dominated mainstream representations of the region, the region that we called our own. This is not strange uh, for, for us to experience. Um, in 1967, shortly after the Six-Day War, Edward Said himself had experienced that sense of uh, psychic um, exile, if you will, uh, when watching uh, coverage of the war in the U.S. press. Through its meticulous documentation and historicization of these narratives, Orientalism was a guide to navigating curiously through the prickly terrain of representation. However, beyond Orientalism, Said's reflections on the relationship between the intellectuals and power and the responsibilities within academia and beyond resonated with scholars who sought a humanist method and a purpose to their work. Now, we describe Edward Said's intellectual legacy as one that can be characterized uh, in two basic thematics. The first being the focus on uh, the notion of the secular exile. Now, um, it is our understanding and the understanding of the 29 different contributors in the book, which, who range from um, activists to uh, cr literal, uh, literary critics uh, to musicologists, etc., etc. Um, we've basically been able to distill, as difficult as that may seem, uh, Edward Said's legacy into uh, two categorical descriptions that are very diffuse in their description, nevertheless. The first being the secular exile. Edward Said was deeply committed to the notion of secularity as a source of criticism. And much of that secularity came from a sense of disparity and distance from the locales that he, uh, that he felt he connected to. He was, at the end of the day, a nomadic cosmopolitan. He associated the motif of exile and the, and the experience, surprisingly, to the, that of the Judaic exile. 
In an interview now immortalized uh, with uh, Israeli daily Haaretz, he described himself as the last Jewish intellectual. That, of course, raised a lot of eyebrows and confused and, and, uh, and remains a controversial statement. While expressing his hope for the future of Palestine Israel, Saeed endorsed a one-state solution until his death, causing discomfort for many Israelis and Palestinians. He, he said, I quote, I want a rich fabric of some sort, which no one can fully comprehend and no one can fully own, end quote. He also said that such a vision encapsulated his persona. He was the intellectual at the end of the day of the resolved. His intent on overcoming the appeal of purity, tidiness, and homogeneity is one that we continue to remember today as the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict and quagmire continues to be all of the above, P impure, untidy, and incre incredibly heterogeneous. In his exp especially expressive interview, Saeed made a compelling case for his binational vision for Palestine-Israel by leveling a compassionate critique at the Zionist obsession with the notion of state and that of the Palestinian as well, but more so the notion of home. When the interviewer observed that Saeed sounded very Jewish in the way he said he stated his cause, um, Saeed responded, of course, I'm the last Jewish intellectual. You don't know anyone else. All of your other Jewish intellectuals are now suburban squires, from Amos Oz to all those people here in America. So I am the last one, the only true follower of Adorno. Let me put it to you this way. I am a Jewish Palestinian. In this statement, Said embodied the exile in his ability, affinity, and desire to destigmatize and congeal with the other, something that most polarized uh, discourses and ideologies fail to, uh, fail to reach, which made him incredibly vilifiable to both, uh, to both sides. He shattered the boundary of the label and aligned himself with the long tradition of Jewish intellectualism, which for him implied the wanderer prophet intellectual described by Chomsky and others, the one who chooses exile and refuses the comfort of serving and legitimizing power. Uh, one who is prepared to challenge allegiances of all sorts. Now, with challenging allegiance, uh, of allegiances of all sorts, I think it's a, mo it's a good moment to stop and contemplate how absurd this experience is uh, that I'm actually you know, going through. Um, I happen to uh, force myself off the computer today as I witnessed my country uh, experience one of the most... Um, intriguing examples of, uh, of revolt and uprising, uh, very much in the, in the tradition that Saeed had described. Uh, it did not fall comfortably into what would otherwise be described as, uh, as a vulgarized form of nationalism, a nationalism that is prepared to destroy all others and dismiss uh, any divergent uh, representations of the other, but rather it was a genuine appeal for plurality. And um, I watched endless videos of Egyptians streaming into the streets. In fact, as I speak today, as I speak now, this very moment, uh, Egyptian police are descending on Tahrir Square, Liberation Square, to uh, ensure that Egyptians disperse and go back to their homes and refuse and stop voicing their opinions and stop uh, challenging the corrupt authoritarian regimes that Edward Said stood against all the way to the very end. But his criticism of nationalism comes from, and by nationalism I'm referring to not the nationalism that inspires uh, liberation movements and self-determination, but rather the uh, discriminatory uh, and, and highly uh, singular and, and very volatile form of, of nationalism that, uh, that disposes of all variation and all uh, diversity. Uh, but much of that criticism of nationalism emerged from the other category, the other characteristic that we feel speaks to Edward Said's legacy, which is the amateur humanist. Uh, Edward Said was uh, a, a professional in his academic career, but very much an amateur in the careers that he uh, ended up um, you know, both creating and carving for himself. Uh, his, his, ma his manual, Orientalism, became uh, very much um, a revered text 
for what would become post-colonial studies. But interestingly, Edward Said uh, uh, d decided that he would not align himself with post-colonial studies for fear that uh, he would become pigeonholed theoretically and, and confined methodologically. So he tried to remain on the boundaries, to exist at the crossroads, uh, and in doing so, remaining an amateur all the way through. His writings about music, uh, and, uh, and literature and art always focused on those who, dis who had grown increasingly comfortable with the discomfort uh, of, of exile and, uh, and the borderlands. And in essence, that is what makes one an amateur, the desire to continue to experiment, to improvise, to operate in an impromptu realm. And that, I, uh, I believe, is very central to Said. But at the very end of his life, uh, one of his final manuscripts published posthumously, uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, humanism and democratic criticism, Edward Said uh, realigned himself with the notion of humanism. What does it mean to be a humanist? Uh, it's, of course, too complicated to delve into now, but nevertheless, uh, it was a reminder that despite uh, Said's commitment to representing Palestinianness, he was also incredibly keen on ensuring that Palestinianness is uh, a universalized condition, a condition that can be experienced by all those who have, um, who have uh, been subjected to the tremors, the, the awfully painful tremors of, of exile, uh, the kind of tremors that, uh, that many in the Arab world are experiencing today, despite having never left uh, their home countries. Said committed his final years to the West Eastern Divan, Divan, a youth orchestra he founded in 1999 with his friend, Israeli-Argentinian composer and pianist Daniel Barenboim. The project brings together young Palestinians, Israelis, and Arab classical musicians, most of whom happen to be youth, to study, rehearse, and perform together. This, as we all know, is a very controversial project, sadly. The hope is that the common goal of practicing a, cosm a composition together and performing in concert will for a moment enable the musicians to transcend the enmity they have developed while growing up in their respective communities. Now this sounds incredibly utopian but, uh, and as, a, as a vision for a binational state, but nevertheless, what are our options? Given what we found out uh, in the last few days, what are our options? And this is something that Said w remembered, recalled, and, uh, and ruminated about from 1993, from the signing of Oslo onwards. Um, the book proceeds to discuss various aspects of Said's uh, general oeuvre, but uh, there is a section that is very particular to, uh, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and notions of... Um, of Zionism. There are two interviews that um, I think are incredibly compelling with two of Said's uh, closest uh, intellectual associates, one being Daniel Barenboim and the other being Noam Chomsky, where uh, we start to see the uh, incredibly problematic uh, notion of, of Zionism and how uh, it was used to varying degrees to express uh, um, the problematic of Palestinian identity. Um, Chomsky, for instance, for the first time, uh, decides to disavow the uh, one-state solution in this particular interview, uh, while still claiming that he is the, um, the originator of the idea, uh, back when he, it appeared to be practical to Chomsky in the mid-60s. But nevertheless, uh, at the end of the day, Chomsky is prepared to acknowledge that uh, Edward Said's loss is an incalculable one, not just for the Palestinians, but for uh, prospects of peace uh, in the future. Uh, there are other essays that I would love to draw attention to, but then again, this is you know 520-page <laughs> manuscript. Um, but I would like to sort of, in closing, uh, before we open it for discussion, uh, read a, a brief paragraph uh, from Joseph Masad, who is uh, one of Edward Said's students and disciples at Columbia University, uh, writes at the end of his chapter, um, and his chapter is entitled Affiliating with Edward Said. Um, he said that the place that Edward Said had created is one of a new language, a new syntax, a new vocabulary to which those who, like him, felt out of place in terrifyingly unjust worlds and could finally belong. Affiliating with Edward Said is then an, aff an affiliation with the place that he created, the principles that guided his life, and the causes for which he fought. And while Edward Said never actually fought 
in the uh, in the material sense uh, against anything. He remains uh, probably the most steadfastly influential uh, spokesperson on behalf of those who were disenfranchised in Palestine, in Tunisia, in Lebanon, and in Egypt today. Thank you. Do we have uh, questions? <laughs> Just <laughs> I have my copy. <laughs> um, where is the book? Can I, I? I mean, do I have an answer for that? Uh, the book is in my possession. <laughs> okay, the book was published in, in August of this past year uh, by University of California Press. Uh, it is available in every conceivable way. I'm sorry, this sounds like too much of a plug, but you know, at the end of the day, this is what you do. But uh, this is this is a copy of the book. It has um, an incredibly rare image of Edward Said towards the end of his life, um, and in fact, it took a while to uh, determine who actually owned the rights to this image uh, because it was one that had never been used prior. But it, it's the title of the book is Edward Said: A Legacy of Emancipation and Representation. And um, as I mentioned, the book has 33 contributors. And of course, it would be very belaboring to go through the different titles. But as I said, it, uh, there's a uh, very lengthy and, uh, and elaborate discussion of every thematic that Edward Said had, had discussed in his, in his writings. Uh, the intention behind the book is not to eulogize or to immortalize Said. Said is immortalized by his own ideas, but rather uh, what, the intention of the book is to continue a conversation. Uh, that it, we're not here to hold Said in, in, um, in, in high stature, but rather to point out uh, the, where Said's departure began. Um, and what this means as far as his philosophy, his project, his ideas, um, and what does it mean to affiliate with Edward Said. Um, so I think, or at least we hope, that uh, this book is the beginning of a larger dialogue about Edward Said's contribution, not just to literary criticism and, and Palestine studies, but beyond. Um, and I think uh, the, the contributions in this volume are uh, very much a step in that direction. Um, I think that sort of kind of answers it. But where it is exactly, it's on Amazon and bookstores and, and elsewhere. Yes? Um, some time ago when he was still alive, but thanks, but um, clearly ill, the Smithsonian had a movie of him talking and answering <laughs> questions for about an hour. And it was so exquisite. And I've looked since then for that film. I don't know. Did you see it? There, there are several films um, with Edward Said. The, probably the one that is being distributed now is called The Last Interview. And it's a fairly, it's a fairly lengthy uh, discussion, very incredibly candid with Edward Said towards the end of his life. And, and one of the most intriguing um, sort of uh, things that you walk away with, ideas that you walk away with as you listen to Edward Said speak after having lived such a, a, a long and, and, and intriguing and engaged and vibrant life in both in the academy and as an activist, um, that he walks away feeling somewhat curtailed, that towards the end of his life he had watched uh, his homelands dissipate, uh, both in Palestine and, and in Egypt becoming increasingly irrecognizable to him, the Cairo of, of his childhood, uh, but also Lebanon. And so there, it's an incredibly somber and melancholy uh, Said. Uh, but I think that had Said lived uh, to this day, that he would be incredibly proud of some of those, uh, some of those locales and the people that inhabit them. go about choosing where to focus on the book and particularly with the contributors um, how did that process work out because you said there was a number of them uh, how did you end up choosing who you chose and, and, and why um, I think I think the 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 contributions and their diversity really speak to Edward Said's legacy more so than our ability to ascertain and and identify potential authors. Um, we uh, we started off with the in, with the desire to put together some sort of conference to discuss Edward Said, uh, but that had already 
been done at various locations. SOAS had an event, LSE had an event, there was a po a, you know, conferences literally all over the world. There are uh, Edward Said Memorial Lectures, there's one here at the Palestine Center, but, but elsewhere at Columbia and Adelaide and, and various locations. Um, so we wanted something a little bit more engaged. We wanted to ensure that the, uh, the fringes, the margins of the discussion about Edward Said would be brought to the fore. Um, and as well as that, we wanted uh, to make sure that the contributions were meditative and really deep, which is part of the problem uh, when, uh, when you have um, uh, writers who feel um, so connected to Edward Said on a, on a personal level, which is the case in this particular book. Uh, but nevertheless, it was a bit of a shot in the dark. Um, we had sent um, emails to uh, people that we identified as, uh, as potential authors that we felt could contribute um, with you know, meaningful, uh, contemplative pieces and, and important essays, uh, and the response was incredibly overwhelming. So it, w it was not a challenge at all to have people speak about how they, how Edward Said's legacy affected them personally and uh, their intellectual um, uh, adventures or, or escapades, if you want. In many cases, this book is a bit of an, of an escapade. It's, it's incredibly acrobatic, theoretically, um, and it's a testament to how Said uh, did his work and, uh, and his, the fact that his project was incredibly varied theoretically and, and methodologically. But uh, the response was overwhelming, as, as you will find uh, in the book. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that, uh, as far as the disciplines are concerned, that we had a, a, a very expansive volume. Um, and we thought that Edward Said's resistance to professionalism within the academy, his desire not to be uh, pigeonholed in a particular sort of area of, of, of thought or ideology, uh, was something that we had to honor in this book as well. So most of the writers and authors come from all walks of life. We have, you know, international lawyers and activists and thinkers and musicians and, and academics. So it's, you know, of course there there are always, you know fissures and, and cracks, and there are a lot of things missing. There's more outside of this book than there is within it, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's a very humble attempt, nevertheless. Now that this is done, what project are you working on now? I am currently working on uh, a manuscript about new media, blogs, social networking in the Arab world, and political participation, and how that's all. So basically what's going on... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm doing. I mean, I'm I'm a media a media scholar, you know, mass communication media studies scholar by by training. So that's sort of my realm. And my interest in Edward Said emerged from the criticism of uh, representation, how representation is done, which is a very mediated process. Uh, and uh, and so that explains why representation factors into the title of the book. That we believe that Edward Said's discussion was uh, that of both emancipation and renewing representations while criticizing what it means to represent. Um, given that you believe you could have put so much more in, has the thought ever occurred to you to do a second volume? I mean, I imagine <laughs> you would be approached by a number of potential contributors, and um, you know, I for one uh, will happily buy your book and would Thank buy you. volume two should there be one. Would you be happy to contribute to the second <laughs> volume? <laughs> That's the, the I think my husband keeps playing the lottery. Oh, okay, <laughs> in that case, um, I think it's a little bit too early to be talking about a, a second volume. I mean, the book has just been out, and I'm still in recuperation recuperation phase, but. Uh, um, we we just have to wait and see where where this book goes and and what it means and if it resonates and and if there's terrain there that we haven't touched upon i think all of that is is yet to emerge of course there are um there are areas where edward said was criticized heavily uh but not and i am not refer, referring to the vilification of the commissars you know i'm talking about you know areas where he was theoretically criticized in a genuine sense uh for instance his discussion of uh gender and how uh, gender relates to colonialism, and um, what some feminist scholars believe uh, Edward Said had done in, in dismissing or ignoring uh, the um, the gendered voice in the post-colonial discourse, um, and that I think is unfortunately 
still missing in most manuscripts about Said today. Uh, but, uh, but my understanding is uh, Gayatri Spivak, who I just heard speak in Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, a couple of days ago, um, she's working on a project of that sort. Um, so I think um, if, you know, if this book um, tears open some space for um, discussion, sort of interdisciplinary discussion about Edward Said, then I think it's, it's served its task. Uh, that it, you know, that was our primary motivation. But, uh, but at the same time, we don't want to turn Edward Said into an in, an industry, uh, mm-hmm. and we surely do not want to commodify and, and consumerize him. Um, so, hopefully, we, we will be doing justice to the causes that he uh, that he advocated, rather than uh, to try and immortalize him as an individual. Would you tell us a little bit about uh, the day after and how it relates to today's happenings? The day after? What do you mean, what do you, what do you mean by the, the day after? The day after. Oh, um, the morning after. Okay. Um, I mean, of course, uh, morning after is an, an absolutely remarkable uh, condemnation of, um, of what... Antonio Gramsci would describe as traditional, uh, traditional intellectuals. Um, Said was very much committed to this idea that there were two forms of intellectuals. There are traditional intellectuals and there are organic intellectuals. Traditional intellectuals committed themselves to serving power in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and organic intellectuals derived their principled, valued uh, values and, and ethics from a, a, a place of um, <coughs> commitment to, you know, to larger causes, to humanity, to self-representation, to self-determination, to uh, the causes that are very much cliché today, that, you know, democratic criticism, you know, rather than anything else. Um, and so uh, the, morning, the Morning After is, is a manuscript that identifies how uh, politics can create or the, how politicians can very much like intellectuals fall into those two camps and really sort of creates a demarcation between how much uh, one is, should be prepared to give up uh, to get acknowledgement and to get recognition from the other camp. Um, but Edward Said, from that point forth, that essay was the beginning of a lot of different writings that Edward Said uh, used to reflect that same point. For instance, um, Peace and Its Discontents grew out of that particular essay. Uh, as well as uh, the peace process and, and various others. Um, so it was the be- a new beginning for Edward Said. And it also, some would argue that uh, that essay was um, the, nas- the nascent moment where Edward Said began contemplating uh, the binational state, the idea of a binational state. So it's a very, very important uh, turning point. Uh, I believe in Edward Edward Said's thinking, and Chomsky goes even farther, and by saying that uh, that moment in time uh, became such a focal, ex- you know, experience and fundamental experience in in Edward Said's uh, life that um, that his understanding of of Palestinian identity may have shifted. I wouldn't go that far, but nevertheless, um, it's it's an interesting proposition. So it is an important piece. You've mentioned Edward Said's commitment to the one-state solution, and I was just wondering, how does this volume dialogue with that and maybe practical applications, or how does it work with that? Um, I think the the volume discusses the one-state solution in as far as <clears throat> presenting uh, the intractability of the status quo, uh, the fact that what we have today is practically unworkable, and I think everybody recognizes that. Uh, but... Uh, but there's still this idea that the one-state solution or the binational state is absolutely impractical and impossible to imagine. So the, the book's intent is to show that Edward Said's commitment to the one-state solution was not just a theoretical one. It was not a theoretical one, but one that he actually put uh, time to envision and see through in the form of the West Eastern Divan, in the form of building solidarity with, uh, with Jewish scholars who uh, were beginning to critique uh, the principles of Zionism, the principles of political Zionism. Now, some would argue that Zionism uh, is an incredibly sort of spectral 
uh, ideology, uh, one of whom happened to be Chomsky, incidentally. In this book, he talks about uh, the anarcho-syndicalist roots of, of Zionism and how there's something salvageable about Zionism. Now, whether or not Edward Said would agree with that is, is for other people to interpret. But nevertheless, uh, this book begins by laying all of this out, laying, laying it all down for us to, uh, to discuss and challenge uh, by showing that Edward Said was committed to a way forward not just in a utopian sense, but in a practical sense, that you need to have youth from, all com from the different communities, from different locales, from different societies and populations and identities converge together to produce music. And that is not, uh, that is not simple. You know, if, y if you were to watch, um, I forget the name of the, of the film, Barenboim film about the West Eastern Divan, uh, that builds up to the performance that the uh, the Divan has in Ramallah. I mean, incredibly uh, difficult and arduous experience to try and put together a concert uh, featuring Palestinian, Israeli, Jordanian, Egyptian, Syrian uh, youth performers uh, in Ramallah. You know, the the barricades, the the isolation, the uh, the barriers, the obstacles created to prevent them from actually coexisting in one space are unimaginable. Uh, but nevertheless, they are, uh, these barriers are breakable and they are penetrable. Um, and so while Edward Said felt that sense of curtailment that I described, uh, he saw a way forward. And that is what he committed his life to towards the end. Without being uh, attracted to or seduced by the naivete of, you know, of idealism. So... Any other question? I really want to read a quote, if you d if you don't mind. This is you know a little bit off the cuff, but uh, this is from this is a short poem actually. If I can find it, sifting through five hundred pages is no easy task. Nope. Okay. Any other questions while I do this? <laughs> Not a particularly graceful process, but ah, okay. This is it's incredibly brief. <laughs> it took longer to find it than it is to, the will to read it. Um, okay, this is this is a, a very very short you know excerpt from uh, a poem by Constantine Cavafy. Uh, the Alexandrian Greek poet uh, who Edward Said was very much uh, interested in uh, because of what he felt was a critical nostalgia about cosmopolitan Alexandria and what that meant because Edward Said's exile from Egypt ref very much reflected some of the same intonations. Uh, but again, w when I read this, you will, you will see that while he wasn't talking about Palestine, he really kind of was. Constantine Cavafy, in a poem called Walls, written in 1896, states, Without consideration, without pity, without shame, they have built great and high walls around me. And in this case, he was talking about the cosmopolitanism of Alexandria. But to Said, that very much evoked uh, the Palestinian you know, status quo. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.